Good evening, folks, and welcome again to this evening service at Tri-City Baptist Church. We are so glad to have you here uh, this evening as part of our uh, prayer summit week, uh, 10 days of prayer, actually, and we're into day number three, and the prayer summit will continue on through next week. You can certainly find details regarding the prayer summit at our website, www.tricitybaptist.org began on Friday, May the 22nd, and will continue through Sunday, May the 31st. We have really enjoyed some very special times together. We've been recording the evening services specifically to the, for the prayer summit, as well as uh, Elisa Sin's ladies' prayer meeting yesterday. And I wanted to show this slide, um, this third slide in. Steve, do we have that out there? Whoops, let me go back one. There we go. Uh, anyway, the prayer summit recording, we just added that button this afternoon. We have the three recordings from Friday night, uh, Saturday night, and the ladies' prayer meeting yesterday morning. And we will continue to add those throughout the week. And so I wanted you to take note of that. That's on the prayer summit page. Also, I wanted to highlight one adjustment for tomorrow. Uh, the cross-impact prayer meeting, for those that would participate in that, has been moved to 11 a.m., and that was moved to accommodate a cross-impact speaker at one of our chapters, and uh, so we're moving that. Also, I wanted to highlight just below that at noon, uh, Pastor R Colin Richards will be doing a noon uh, prayer meeting throughout the week. And so that is something we didn't have so far. So those are the, <laughs> excuse me, the two additions that we have, and I wanted you to be aware of that. Also on Tuesday, it is a busy week. We have our biweekly food bank. This will be from 2.30 to 4.30, an opportunity for those in our community as well as those in our church who may have a need, especially during this time. It is a drive through food bank, so we have several volunteers. They'll start tomorrow and prepare all day on Tuesday uh, to service those folks. We really appreciate our volunteers that are serving in food bank and the opportunity. We've had the last two food banks of record numbers of folks uh, coming through with needs as would be expected uh, during this time. And this morning we mentioned that uh, we are starting to look at phasing in a reopening of Tri-City Baptist Church. For details on that, uh, we did send out a church-wide uh, email yesterday of pastors' somewhat weekly newsletter. And so if you did not receive that, please feel free to reach out to me or the office and we'll ensure that you get a copy of that sent to you as well. But if you've not had a chance to read that, uh, it highlights uh, many of the details and, and areas that we're trying to address in our uh, potential times for phasing in for the um, our reopening. And we're really looking forward to getting back with everyone. At this time, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, as would be appropriate with the prayer summit, and we'll begin this service today. Father, thank you for the time that we now have to meet together. And though there are a few of us in the auditorium, there are many of us connected electronically, and we thank you for the technology that allows this now. Though it's not an ideal situation, we know that where two or three are gathered together, you're with us. And we know that even through these means, you're with us at all times. You'll never leave us, you'll not forsake us, and you'll join with us as we fervently seek you in prayer. And Father, you look for our prayers, you look for our worship as a sweet aroma unto you. And so may it be that this season of prayer and this service tonight will be a sweet aroma to you. We look for the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts even now as we desire to be revived personally, corporately, and renewed as we move forward in ministry and service for you. And Father, we pray that the power would go out in these gospel messages uh, that would impact our community. We would continue to work as we would see souls saved. Open our hearts this night. Teach us what you would have for us and use us in this week that's coming. Bless us now in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Skip, and good evening to each of you who are able to join us. Thank you so much. It means a lot. 
This is day three of our prayer summit uh, of 10 days. And what a, what a very needy, needy focus emphasis, that of, of prayer. Uh, this morning we talked about the acronym ACTS to describe the different elements of prayer. The A is adoration, the C, confession, the T, thanksgiving, the S is supplication. Uh, we make our requests known for ourselves, and when we pray for others, those requests or petitions are known as intercessory requests. So tonight uh, we'll be focusing on the S, on the acronym X, uh, as we talk about supplicating, supplication, intercessory prayer, especially how to pray for spiritual leaders. So uh, 18 years ago, we had our first visit to Tri-City Baptist Church. Uh, it was an exciting trip. Uh, we flew in at night. We weren't able to sit together on the plane. That was discouraging, but we, uh, we got in late, and it was uh, overwhelming to see all the lights of, of Denver as we, as we came in the DIA. Our guests, our host, picked us up and took us to the, the Westin, right around the corner from the church. It was late at night, but we anticipated in the morning when we opened up the blinds and the curtains that we were, would probably, probably be looking at the Rocky Mountains, and indeed, that was true. And uh, what a beautiful sight. It uh, arrested our interests and hearts immediately. My first assignment that weekend was to speak to the men. At that time, we had a men's prayer breakfast or a prayer meeting or missions uh, focus on Saturday morning. So my very first message was basically the heart of what I'm going to share with you tonight. So uh, going back 18 years, the very first devotional I gave was this topic, how to pray for spiritual leaders. We're going to be looking at the passages where Paul humbly asked prayer for himself throughout his letters. So uh, you can follow with me this evening. Uh, we'll begin in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, it is likely that this was Paul's first letter that he wrote. Some, some debate over that, perhaps Galatians. Uh, both were written pretty close to each other. But uh, let's begin here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. I place this text first because it, it establishes a pattern in Paul's letters. What we see is he first prays for the individual or the church uh, that he's addressing with his letter, and then later in these letters, he then asks prayer for himself. So there's this uh, very rich theme of praying for one another, reciprocating prayer. So 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. So uh, that tells us in just one verse a lot about Paul's prayer life. He's a, one who's walking with God, giving thanks to God. He knows these uh, believers here at Thessalonica, and he's praying for them. And he makes mention of them. The impression is he knows them by name. It's just not a generic, broad sweep, you know, Lord bless all the folks at the church. Uh, it appears he's, he remembers, he has taken note, and he specifically prays for those folks. Then at the end of the epistle, chapter 5, you can turn there with me, verse 25, just a, a really, really simple, generic statement. And if this was the only time Paul asked for prayer, uh, we would kind of, I would almost feel disappointed. You know, Paul will pray for you, but how can we pray for you? What are the specifics? What are the details? And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, he, he addresses the church properly so, brethren, it's a family. And he's going to ask them to pray. And he says, pray for us. And um, that makes sense. Only brothers and sisters in Christ can pray effectively to God. God's not obligated to hear the prayer of the unbeliever, except uh, when they call upon the Lord in faith. Uh, that prayer for salvation, he has so chosen to obligate himself to respond to that immediately. But uh, other than that, unbelievers, uh, he has no obligation to answer their prayers. But in this case, the brothers, we have uh, an access to God uh, through Christ's work, we can come to the throne of grace, and we can pray. We can pray for one another. So Paul here says, pray for us. And uh, the verb here, to pray, is actually a command. So he is really putting it very clearly. Look, when it comes to, to, to doing church work and mission work, we have got to pray for one another, and it's so important. I'm going to stress that with an imperative, pray for us. To not do so would be to sin. So brethren, pray for us. Notice that he doesn't just simply say, pray for me. He says, pray for us, because typically Paul worked with a team. Yes, there were times he was alone, but when he did his church planning work, there was usually Timothy and him or Silas and him or others working together on a, on a church plant. There was a team. 
And he's asked the church there to pray for that team of which he was the leader. So pray for us. That's humility. He's an apostle. He's seen Christ. He, he's had privileges caught up to the third heaven. You know, wow. But yet he asks for prayer. He realizes his need of dependence upon God. He realizes his need for others to intercede for him. So pray for us. When I think of our church family right now, as we talk about praying for our, your spiritual leaders, I'll just give you an overview of our staff and some of the people that I think these petitions, these intercessory statements are extreme, extremely applicable. Uh, obviously, uh, as your pastor, um, senior pastor, we then have and I'll, no list of, in, in the sense of importance, they're all they're equal, we're all co-laboring, we're all friends. But uh, we have Pastor Skip Hunter now, Shields Hunter, as our administrative pastor, also helping in support uh, to several departments, the Young and Heart Department, and some other areas of ministry. So Pastor Skip's been with us from the beginning uh, of the year, doing a great job. Um, I don't know what we would have done for this crisis without uh, his willingness to put in very long hours and administrate. So thank you, Skip. But to pray for us, that would include Skip. Uh, to pray for us would include Dr. Brian Malik. Uh, Brian wears several hats and has done just an outstanding job uh, with the children's ministry as well as overseeing the missions department. And uh, that's no small task. That's a big, big responsibility. And uh, pray for him. Pray for him in these responsibilities. Pray for us. Uh, Nathan Stedman, at the beginning of the year, I said, Nathan, we are, we are several staff members behind. Uh, we haven't backfilled yet. And I'm going to need you, you. You've got to put your big boy pants on. We've we, we got work to do. Roll up your sleeves. And uh, Nathan did just that all year. He's just been working, filling gaps, helping in, in areas even uh, outside of his own department, just filling gaps, filling gaps. How can I help? How can I serve? And so when I say, brethren, pray for us, that would include praying for Nathan Stedman. When it comes to our young adult singles and our young married, we have not yet backfilled to place a pastoral leader over those departments. Uh, thankfully, Josh and Liz Conable, Brendan and Sarah Penley, and Jamie and Debbie Dirksen, uh, they have kept the singles ministry going forward. We're indebted to them. Thank you, all, all three of these couples, for their work. Uh, when it comes to young married, we did not backfill that yet with a, a pastor oversight or involvement. Uh, Mike and Lori Thomas stepped in that gap and really did a super job uh, preserving that unity and working with them and loving them. So thank you so much. In these areas of young adults, we have recently backfilled the CIM National Director position with Dr. Keith Huda. Keith has worked in Mexico as a, an administrator, as a director, as a president, has a, a very healthy um, philosophy of ministry, and we felt that he would be mature and would be uh, one who would do a great job in this administrative role as national director. So Keith is doing that and has uh, really helped us reboot uh, a ministry that was sadly slipping. So pray for Dr. Huda. So when we talk about praying for us, pray for, pray, pray for him. Uh, when we ask you to pray for us, that would include Pastor Colin and his wife, Katie Richards. Uh, they stepped into the music department and uh, filled an enormous gap as a volunteer couple in this area. Uh, Colin, in addition to that, has been helping out with the family life ministry, which isn't fully yet overseen uh, with, with maybe on-site pastoral care, but uh, Colin is doing all he can ministering to that group as well. So when we ask you to pray for us, we're asking to pray for Colin. Pray for the, the pastor's wives uh, and their families. When we ask you to pray for us, uh, that means to pray for Larry Robbins, his wife, Karen. And he still works with the young at heart. He still works uh, here in the city of Westminster uh, as a chaplain. So pray for him. Pray for us. Uh, Larry's role has been greatly uh, decreased over the last year, the last two years, uh, but still is on staff in a part-time role. But we ask you to pray. Pray for us. That would include Larry Robbins. When we ask you to pray for us, that would include praying for Dean and Brenda Hendricks. And if you're aware that Dean has not been feeling real well recently, in recent months, he's been going through a battery of tests. Uh, thankfully, nothing has yet been uh, determined uh, as to the root of his uh, just not feeling real well, not having a lot of strength and energy. But uh, pray for us. That would include our Hispanic pastor there, uh, Dean Hendricks. When we say pray for us, brethren, that would include praying for Hai Nguyen. He's our Vietnamese pastor. Uh, his wife, Kelly, that would mean pray for us. Pray for the leadership team. Uh, pray for the Vietnamese. It would include this summer, pray for our interns. We have two interns 
uh, Andrew Huda and Jacob Rodriguez. They served with us last year. So when we ask you to pray, to pray for us, pray for them. Uh, they're working. They're being uh, mentored. They're, being, they're, they're involved in the work here. Pray for Andrew and Jacob. Uh, we have other pastors who are just volunteering and helping, uh, filling you know, significant roles. Jim and Ann Steele, uh, when I ask you to pray for us, pray for Jim. Uh, he has filled in a lot in the teaching area with Young at Heart and uh, brings a, a, a great theological balance to the table. So pray for us. Pray for Jim. Pray for his ministry and teaching. Um, before the COVID-19 and for the last couple of years, Don Metzler has done a yeoman's job here weekly with a prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, we'll see where we are when we get back to normalcy. But uh, when we ask you to pray for us, men like Don Metzler, what a, what a servant. Thank you, Don, for your labor of love, uh, working with the young and hard in the prayer meeting. We have Ken and Jolene Fulton helping out with the ABF. Thank you. Pray for us. Pray for Ken. Pray for his ministry in that role. Uh, pray for Ed and Marla Bulkley. We've been asking Ed to join us for some meetings. Uh, we're praying about some help in the area of counseling. So when we talk about pray for us, pray for, for these, these men, pray for these wives of the men, pray for these families. I would also add, when I say please pray for us, pray for our missionaries. We have about 40 plus uh, missionary families that we regularly support. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them specifically, but let's pray for them. So brethren, pray for us. So when talking about praying for spiritual leaders, at least for our purposes tonight, pray for these, pray for us. Spurgeon was asked when his uh, ministry just, just amazingly grew in, in London, uh, the largest uh, non-Catholic church in the world. And uh, he was asked, really, uh, what is the key to your ministry's success? And he would say, always. It was because people prayed for him. He said, my people pray for me. And I would say, please pray for us. If we're going to have success, uh, any eternal value, it's going to be through the work of the Spirit of God and people praying. Pray for us. Now, let's walk through these epistles of Paul and begin identifying more specific ways to pray rather than just praying generically to be blessed. Let's talk about some of these specifics. So if you would turn with me to Philippians 1, 19 through 20. Here the Apostle Paul uh, is not actually asking them to pray. They already are. And everyone would love a church like the church of Philippi uh, standing behind them. This church gave to Paul. This church prayed for Paul. This, this church sent encouraging workers to Paul or a worker to Paul. This is an amazing church and a church we would strive to want to, to imitate. So Paul's writing to him. He's in prison. This is a prison epistle. He says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. He's saying, I'm in a, in a situation right now. I'm in prison for my faith. And um, for me to be saved, not spiritual salvation, that's not in view. It's physical deliverance, to be delivered from jail, to get back on the streets, to preach, to plant churches, to do the work of an apostle. He says, for I know that this shall turn to my deliverance or salvation. And, and the means in which there's going to be this hinge in which there's deliverance is then spelled out through your prayer. And in conjunction with that, and result of that, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he is saying, I'm in a really critical spot here, and I know you've been praying for me, and I believe your prayer is going to make all of the difference. Truly, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, but uh, there's benefits for me to continue to have ministries, what Paul's writing to them, and to have that continued ministry, I'm really depending upon your prayer and the supply of the Spirit. So I'm going to just take that text and one application of it for us to pray about and to pray for leaders, certainly to do this for one another, but to pray for the supply of the Spirit. The word supply means assistance or provision or support. It comes, uh, our English word choreography actually comes from this Greek word. And so it's the Holy Spirit who is, who is orchestrating, providing, assisting, leading, Paul's ministry. He's the one supplying all that, all that he and his team really needed. But there is a human er 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 responsibility here, a human realm. People need to pray that, that, that God would supply all that we need for, for doing ministry. And then he has a standard in which this supply is measured by in three ways in verse 20. So this supply of the Spirit 
is going to keep these things fueled and up to speed according to, in this view, in relationship to my earnest expectation of my hope. Uh, that's something really to pray for people. Lord, I pray for the supply of the Spirit, that the Spirit would orchestrate the ministry at Tri-City Baptist Church and would orchestrate his efforts through the leadership team here, and that it would be according to this earnest expectation hope. You can't do much ministry without hope. You need hope. Without hope, we are really miserable, all of us. And so you're, you're praying, Lord, supply the Spirit. Give our people hope, confidence, assurance. Your word's going to, to meet the needs of ministry. Secondly here, the su supply of the Spirit is measured uh, by the next phrase, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always. So the supply of the Spirit is going to lead to Christian workers being bold speaking courageously for God. We need to pray that way for one another. Pray for your leaders. Pray for us that we would have hope in ministry. We'd be encouraged. We'd have uh, an expectation that God's at work, and we're going to see great things accomplished by the grace of God. Let, let's pray that we have boldness. And then thirdly, it says, so now also Christ shall be magnified my body, whether it be by life or by death. You know, really, all of our focus should be to make Christ large, is the idea to magnify Christ by, by, by our living and even by our death, that people would have the right view of our Lord, that he would be preeminent. And the supply of the Spirit, the, spot, the Spirit spotlights Jesus. And we want him to be seen as he is, big, great, large. So there's a, a wonderful prayer request here in this heading, pray for the supply of the Spirit for your spiritual leaders that the Spirit of God will meet all the needs that we have to do the work of the Lord. Secondly, and another request, is to pray for the support of the saints. Now, the irony of that statement is that they, the church, they're begging, praying, pleading with Paul to take the gift they want to give him and, take, and, and then to take that upon them so they can continue some unique partnership, koinonia, fellowship, participation uh, with other saints. And so uh, this category, very broad, but uh, certainly to pray for the support of the saints, we need the supply of the Spirit. We need all the spiritual uh, resources to do ministry, but there's also physical elements to ministry, physical support. Verse 5 says, and this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and then unto us by the will of God. So they had a a heart where they dedicated themselves to God, and that led to a, you know, a, a spirit that desired to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul's ministry needed financial support, although he never personally asked for it for himself. He would be very pleased to ask for finances for others, but his support came from self-employment, tent making. His support came at times from the churches he was ministering in, or at times they came. His support actually came from other churches, but there's a lot of expenses for Paul. You know, there's housing, there's transportation, uh, there's medical expense when he didn't have Dr. Luke with him. There's often legal expense, and so when he didn't have Cenas the lawyer, there was those type of expenses. And so ministries need the support of the saints. Pray for that. Uh, as we assess where we are financially, the Lord has blessed despite the COVID-19. God has been meeting our needs here uh, ab abundantly, thankfully, graciously. We've been able to manage the expenses so that the income still exceeds the outgo. So we have been very graciously blessed by God. But you need to pray. You need to pray for those. Pray for us. Pray for our missionaries. Uh, we have continued sending monthly support as we've committed ourselves to every missionary. Uh, they have not missed a check. They've been sent out as they are, you know, very much, uh, very religiously on time. And uh, they appreciate that. But not every church and not every supporter is going to be able to continue to support some of our missionaries. We will anticipate some of our missionaries will be needing more support because some churches just can't do it. And so uh, I think it's a very important application night to pray for our missionaries, to pray for their support needs to be met so they can keep doing the work without some of these distractions. So pray for the supply of the Spirit. Secondly, pray for the support of the saints. Thirdly, Paul's going to ask in the book of Colossians another specific prayer request. 
In fact, it's a command. Verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, continue. Continue in prayer. Continually continue. Uh, the idea of the verb here to continue is to attach yourself, to wait on prayer, to make prayer just a part of your life, where there, it's, you're not separated from a life of prayer, but you're continually praying, and you're attached to prayer. It's just part of you. It's who you are as a, a believer in Christ. You're a praying person. And then he says, and watch, be alert. Don't go to sleep. And then in the same, in your alert state as you're praying, pray with thanksgiving. We talked about the ACTS acronym. A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. Here we go. So pray. Pray alertly. Pray with thanksgiving. Make this an additive to your prayer. Keep that focus. This is the will of God for you, to give thanks for everything. And so stay in the will of God. Stay on target with thanksgiving. And then he says, with all praying also for us. Here we go. Pray for us. But he goes beyond just the generic brethren pray for us to, to spell out how he wanted them to pray. So the saints at Colossae, he says, you pray for us with this purpose, that God, with this result, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. The King James word there, the Greek word behind that is logos. That's the word word. So pray for us that we would have a, an opening to speak the word, to speak a word. And the gospel is what is in view here, to speak the mystery of Christ. That's the good news, the gospel that Christ came, died, buried, rose again. So he's asking them to pray for open doors to speak the word. They're missionaries. Let's say they have their support. Let's say they have the supply of the Spirit. Now they need an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And he says, I'm in the jail for this. This is another prison epistle. You know, I was speaking, and for this I'm in jail, for my faith and for my proclamation of truth. But do pray that I have opportunities. And you think about it, he's in jail. How many opportunities do you have? Oh, he's going to witness to the guards. He's going to witness to the jailer. He's going to witness to other people in jail around him if, they can, if he's in, in distance for them to hear him. But he's praying for opportunities. Pray for us. We have opportunities to get the gospel out. And that when I do have these opportunities, that I may make it manifest with clarity. And you would think, you know, Paul would be, a, as, a, as a scholar, as one who had been preaching for years, you'd think he would have it down by then. But there are some times you just, you just jumble all your words together, and, and, and you can't put it all together clearly with clarity. And as he is asking prayer for here, that, you make, that I make it manifest as I ought to speak. This is the way I should communicate. But it's a spiritual discipline, and there's a war going on as it comes to communication. So pray, he says, for an opportunity, an open door to speak the gospel. Uh, I'm always nervous when um, I think about this prayer request. Will you start praying for us that we have doors and opportunities to preach? That, that scares me a little bit. So what might that lead to? Because I believe God answers this prayer. So as you pray for us, let's pray for opportunities. I love it when I see our staff preaching at, at, here at church in different ways. I love it when our staff is, is, is preaching at whether it be at a, at a camp, the Infinity Camp or Camp Grace, or, or to see our staff preaching at a youth conference or, or a men's retreat or whatever it may be. Uh, that's encouraging when you have a multi-staff preaching at different places, using their gifts for the glory of God. That's, that's encouraging to see. Pray for our missionaries that they too have opportunities to speak about the mystery of Christ, the gospel of Christ. Now, as I think about being scared a little bit about what that might lead to, that leads us to the next prayer request. So Paul in the book of Colossians asked that they pray that, that he would have opportunities to speak doors that would be opened. And when he had those doors to speak with clarity, but also when those opportunities come that we wouldn't shrink in our spirit. We know that God hasn't given us a spirit of cowardice or fear. But our nature's that way. Timothy's nature was that way. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, there's a fourth request that I would note to this evening. We, this evening we're to pray for the supply of the Spirit to be provided for every worker. We're to pray for, for the support of, of the saints. Uh, we are to pray uh, for these speaking opportunities. 
And when they come, that we take advantage of them and speak with force and conviction and power and, and boldness and courage. So he says here, praying, and this part of simple here is, is a present tense, keep on praying always with all prayer, keep petitioning God, keep bringing these requests before God and supplication. So these requests go beyond just praying for yourself, pray for others, intercede, and do this in the realm of the Spirit. So as you're praying, there's a relationship to the Holy Spirit. And you're asking him to fill God's servants to, 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 to preach and have opportunities and to have power, to have boldness when they preach. And he says, watching, again, be alert, be alert, be awake. Be watching, Darren, too, of all perseverance. When you're praying, uh, it's hard work. You want to quit. You want to fall asleep. Don't. Keep persevering. Keep being persistent in this undertaking of prayer. So do this with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Wow, that's quite a statement to, to intercede for not just a few, but for everyone, for all saints. The Lord puts on our heart, and we know. So to intercede for all saints. And then he makes it specific, and for me. Pray for me. Intercede for me. Okay, Paul, how can we pray for you? Well, he already asked, pray for opportunities, doors to be open. And now he says that utterance, there we go again, that's the logos, that the word may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth. And how? Boldly. Boldly. Here's Paul. You think he's a, he's a courageous man. No, he's just like us. He needed, he needed the Holy Spirit to fill him. He needed this power. He needed this boldness, this courage to, to make known the mystery of the gospel to others. So he's praying here, and the heading is, pray for the supernatural boldness of the speaker. And he's asking exactly that, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds. Again, he's in jail. Here's another prison epistle. So all these letters is about the gospel going forward, and he's in jail. He wants opportunities, and he wants opportunities to come, and when they come, he wants to preach with boldness. But he's depending upon God's people to pray that way for him, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak. And he repeats it for the second time. And Paul's not one who wastes a lot of words. So boldly, this is how I ought to speak. And this is how we ought to pray. So Paul says, please pray for speaking opportunities. And when they come, pray for supernatural boldness. Okay, let's, let's go for the progression of thought. So the supply of the Spirit is ministering to your spiritual needs. So the support of the saints is ministering to your physical needs. And you're praying for speaking opportunities, and they come. And when they come, you preach with boldness. What can you anticipate? You can anticipate revival and rejection. And so watch what happens here in the next request, number five of eight. Second Thessalonians 3.1, as he concludes this letter, he says, finally, as I wrap this all up, brethren, pray for us. So once again, pray for us. Pray for spiritual leaders. Okay, Paul, how can we pray for you specifically? Thanks for asking us to pray. We get it. You need it. We need it. Pray for us. What should we pray for, Paul? And then he tells you that the word of the Lord may have free course. The idea of that verb may have free course, this present active subjunctive means to progress, to run. And when it's coupled with the next phrase, and be glorified, it, it is, it is, he is asking us to pray that the word of God, that I'll preach it with boldness, and that it will be successful. There will be fruit for, for our labors. That the word of God would be glorified. It would be triumphant. There would be some victories, people getting saved, people getting right with God, people growing in their faith. So pray for the success of the scriptures. And then he says, look, this is what we did for you. You guys have been living godly. You've been growing. You've been advancing. And uh, the word of God, it's, it's having that free course with you. And it's being spoken very highly of because of how it's transformed your lives. Pray for other ministries and other people that when we preach, we preach with boldness and that there'd be some success stories. Number five. Number six. If you start having success, just mark it down, you're going to have resistance. And so what we have here 
is actually the number one prayer request of the Apostle Paul. I don't have all the references to it here, but there's six of these. Six different times Paul prays for safety. He's in a spiritual battle. Oh, he pray for his heart, you know, protect him spiritually. Uh, pray for his emotions so he doesn't have a meltdown. But there are people who want to kill Paul. We see that throughout the book of Acts in his epistles. He references some pretty nasty people. So he's going to ask us to pray for the safety of this, this soldier and other soldiers like him. And I, I think of, you know, this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, you know, I just love our military, our current people who serve in the various branches. Uh, I just love our country. Uh, I was hoping to have, I don't know if he's a general or whatever he is, I was hoping to have a gentleman speak this weekend. Uh, he will be coming for Veterans Day, Lord willing, to speak to us from the, from the Pentagon, a friend of mine. And I just love him and love our soldiers. And uh, they're in a war. <laughs> they're in a war physically. We're in a war spiritually. And uh, Paul's a fight. He's a soldier. He's fighting a good fight. And he's going he's gonna to finish the course, thankfully. We need to pray for one another that we finish the course. We, we fight a good fight. So here he says, in view of the success of the Scriptures, having free course, he then says, and that, pray for this, that we may be delivered. The verb here is rescued, removed from unreasonable and wicked men. Wicked, you have, that, you have the idea of what that means. Wicked is wicked. Unreasonable. Uh, the particular noun here is men who are out of place. Men who are evil. Men who are inappropriate. Men who go beyond the authority given to them. Men who are overreaching. Uh, men that have an agenda. Men that are arrogant. Men who are seeking to control. Men who are trying to stop the church. Uh, men who do not have a relationship with God who are not rational, that are not reasonable, that are not godly, but they're wicked. And as uh, we seek to open our church in two weeks, two Sunday nights from now, as the Lord allows, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to look out here and uh, we'll have it properly stationed where people can come in and there'll be at least six feet or so uh, between the individuals and families. We'll have families stay together. We'll have a couple stay together. We'll have individual space throughout the auditorium and we'll do the proper spacing. We'll talk through some of those details, but it's going to be really, really neat to see as many folks as the Lord so leads to bring back. Uh, there will be some folks we know who will not want to come back immediately. Uh, we have a number of people that are at higher risk with some predisposed health issues and things that probably wouldn't be wise to initially come back. But for those who, who believe God would have them rejoin the services as we begin in, with an evening service, uh, I look forward to looking around our auditorium once again. I look forward to us singing some songs as a church. And uh, I don't know how people can go three months without church, but there's a lot of Christians, sadly, who said no to church and have been out of church for three months. They've chosen that. Uh, they have said this isn't essential to their Christian walk, which is just absurd and tragic. But when we open the doors and people start coming back, how will our government respond? Uh, we'll hear more from our governor this week. He has a plan. It's very restrictive. I don't think it's based on the, the science. I think there's other agendas. Uh, what will the government do? Well, that's always a challenge. You know, life has its challenges. We must live by faith. We're going to take the high road in this case. We're going to start our services back up. We're going to incrementally and safely work to full services in due time here uh, through these next few weeks and months. Well, what about people who re will resist that? who are unreasonable. What do we do? Well, the first line of defense is stated here. Paul's saying, please pray that I and we would be delivered as we do our work and worship for God from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. That's so true. And so this is the number one prayer request. Six different times. I'll give you a second one here. Same theme, prayer for, pray, to pray for the safety of the soldier. Romans 15, 30, verses 30 and 31, A. He says, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren. Again, he's talking to the brethren. Pray for us. Brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Here's the motivation. For Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. I love that phrase, for the love of the Spirit. Is that an objective genitive or is that a subjective genitive? As an objective genitive, uh, do we get motivated in our service for the love 
of the Holy Spirit, where he's the object of our love, or the love of the Holy Spirit, where we're the object of his love. So who's the object? Are we loving the Holy Spirit, or is the Holy Spirit loving us? If the Holy Spirit's loving us, then that's a subjective genitive. He's the subject of the verb. If he's the object of the verb, that's an objective genitive. But it's written in such a way, maybe both are in view. We should serve God, we should pray, we should strive together because God loves us and we love him. Regardless of your view of your interpretive uh, interpretation of the genitive use there, the noun, we all know that God first loved us and then we loved him. I think that's a good order. It's a biblical order. In the beginning, God's always a good order. And so we have here for the love of the spirit and for Christ, for these two persons of the Trinity, and of course, the father, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He's, he's trying, you know, what higher appeal could he ever make? What greater motivation could ever be given? He's saying here, on the basis of God and your love for God and his love for you, please pray for us. And, and with me in your prayers, please pray for me. Pray for us. And then he tells you for what purposes and how to pray. He says that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And so the word delivered here is the same word we just looked at in 2 Thessalonians, to be rescued or delivered from unreasonable men. It's the same thing. Pray for me. There's people that hate my guts. There are people who would like to see me dead. There are, there are people who want to silence me. There are people who, who, when I've been in jail, they're happy I'm in jail. So pray for me that I be delivered from them that do not believe. And I would ask the same to pray for us, that we would be delivered from unreasonable men and from them that do not believe. In the same chapter, there's a seventh and eighth prayer request. In Romans 15, 31b, the theme now is a second request, pray for his safety. Now he's going to pray for his service to be accepted. Pray for the saint's acceptance of the servant's service. That's a tongue pull. It's horrible when your outline points extend beyond the number of words in the statement itself. That's really terrible outlining. So, for Jacob and Andrew, please do not follow my, my homiletical, terrible example here. And that's the challenge of alliteration. You get these dilemmas. But Romans 15, verse 31b, he says that my service, my diakonia, my deaconing, my service, and the service in view here is that the church in Jerusalem is struggling. There's a lot of physical needs. And Paul has been raising up an offering a mobile food bank to go to Jerusalem where the Gentiles in the newly formed churches in the empire are actually giving to their Jewish brethren. And Paul is very concerned that the Jewish Christians may not even take the gift because it's coming from Gentile hands. And Paul's been teaching that the middle wall of partition has been taken down, that the, that the church both Jew and Gentile stand before Christ on, on equal ground. Both male and female stand before Christ on equal ground. Both servant and master stand before Christ on equal ground. And now he has an opportunity to demonstrate it in action, saying, look, here's your brothers, these Gentile Christians who want to serve you, love you, help you. Please accept their gift. But Paul's not real sure if they will. Most problems on the mission field is Christian workers not getting, along, not, uh, not getting along, not accepting one another's service and their calls and their ministries and their focus. So he says, would you pray for me? He says that my service, my ministry here, which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that they'll accept what I've done and those who've done it with me, who've partnered to try to help. Would you pray for that? Pray for the saints' acceptance of the servant's service. And then finally, the eighth prayer request, same chapter, is of course, when you put all, string together all these prayer requests and activity that, that is generated, you, you've got one who's supplied by the Spirit of God. You see one who is, whose physical su support is, is provided. You see one who's praying for opportunities and has them. And once has them, he speaks boldly because prayer has been offered that he would preach that way as he ought. And then as God so wills, he wants his word to have free course and, and run and progress and advance and be glorified. And of course, when you start to see progress and fruit and results, then it's met with resistance. And then you have to pray, oh, Lord, you know, help me, folks. Pray for me that I be delivered from, you know, wicked, unreasonable people. 
And, and then even when it comes to Christian ministries, pray that other Christian ministries being worked together and accept one another and accept what we're trying to do for the Lord, that we don't compete. We're not jealous and we're not stupid. So uh, pray for this. And what you're seeing here, it's a battle. And, and, and I think the most difficult of all works is gospel work because it's eternally essential. And so we who are serving the Lord, it doesn't have to be those who are on, quote, a, a staff that are in the midst of this battle. All Christians are in this battle. And, and the reality is Satan wants to wear down the saints, as the book of Daniel says. Satan wants to just wear us out, where we're burned out, where we're tired, where we do grow weary and well-doing. We just run, run ragged. We're veneer thin. And, and you just feel this with Paul as he writes this last request for spiritual refreshment for this, this, this slave, this doulos. He says here, pray this too, that, that I may come unto you and I wouldn't be so wore out that there's no joy left, that that's all been squeezed, but that I come unto you with joy. That, that, that my spirit, there's a lightness to my spirit, that there be joy uh, by the will of God. And, and then would you pray that, that I come with this attitude and spirit and that when I'm with you, pray for this, uh, that I'll be refreshed. And you, you think of that verb, that's a really long, long verb. Wow, just looking at the Greek letters, it's almost like a whole alphabet This may be refreshed. I'm tired just looking at it. But he's saying, would you pray that when I get there, I could rest there, I could get some relaxation. Uh, in some cases, that verb is actually used for the word sleep. Maybe I get caught up in my sleep, get refreshed a little bit, a little bit of a sabbatical, you could say, some rest. And he's asking for prayer for that. You know, that's important. Um, it's, it's been fun to watch the last couple of years. Our leadership has tried to um, help us to, to get, have at times some refreshment like that. Uh, actually, in 2018, um, we were very close to uh, starting a sabbatical for a short window of time uh, to, to fulfill this text that you might be refreshed. And then we had some issues with our staff. And we just, I and we as a leadership team said, this is not the time to do that. And uh, another day, and so this, this spring in March, uh, we were actually visiting my father, stepfather, my mom, and the leadership team had gotten together, Pastor Skip and a few of the pastors said, I think Pastor and his wife probably could use a little refreshment, they're a little run down, and um, they put together a beautiful sabbatical plan, which was to start, I think, next Monday, and uh, that's changed, that's changed, and, and we don't begrudge that at all. We're in a different circumstance. It's certainly not the time to be refreshed. And what's amazing is the Lord is more than able to give refreshment to God's people without, quote, a sabbatical. Uh, I believe he gives that to us by his grace. But it's also something Paul asked for. He needed at times rest. You need rest. We can't violate the law of the Sabbath for too long without paying a price. So all of us, there's a, a balance in, in the Christian walk. Yes, we should work. Paul says, I labored more than any of the apostles. He wasn't bragging. He was just saying he, he just worked. He was single. He was free to do that. And he worked. Uh, no one could keep up with his work ethic. He was a powerful man. And, and yet he wore thin. He moiled and toiled. He was wore down, veneer thin. And, and Paul's saying, look, when I come, would you pray that there'd be some refreshment? And we all need that. We're, we're going through a very challenging time of COVID-19. Um, it, it's just not your life that's been affected. It's the church life and church workers' life. It's been missionaries' lives. And in many cases, our, our workers are working harder, literally, than ever uh, to try to somehow sustain the ministries and to keep people in touch and try to move forward. So let's pray for one another. There, there would be the refreshment that Paul here prays for. So in summary this evening, pray for your spiritual leaders. Pray for us. In review, what does that look like? There's eight specific prayer requests uh, that I've, I've covered tonight. Six of them are explicitly given by Paul. Two are, are implied or in, inferred from the passages I read. But let's look at these and then we'll close in prayer. Pray for the supply of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit orchestrates the ministry that we're Spirit-filled and Spirit-led people. Secondly, pray for the support of the saints. Got to be support. Ministries need to run. There's physical things that are needed. Pray for the support of the saints. Especially pray for our missionaries that their support needs are met. Pray for the speaking opportunities of the soul winner. Pray for those. 
Um, I'm always nervous when my wife starts praying for me to have opportunities because every time some unique opportunities come. What's ahead of us if we pray like this? Lord, give me an opportunity to witness, give our speakers, give our leaders some spiritual opportunities as well. And when we have those opportunities, pray for the supernatural boldness of the speaker. Let's be courageous. Let's maximize those opportunities that come our way. And then when they come, uh, let's pray that faith would be mingled with the word. There would be success of the scriptures. That they, that they, the scriptures, would have free course and be glorified. And let's pray for the safety of the soldier. We're in a battle. Satan would like to take any one of us out. So pray for the safety of the soldier. Pray that we be delivered from temptation and from the evil one. Pray, seventhly, for the saints' acceptance of the servant's service. Let's pray. Let's pray we can work together, that we have a big picture of, of what the church really looks like, this oneness, this unity that we endeavor to maintain. And finally, let's pray for the spiritual refreshment of the servant and for the, for the, for the believers, uh, that we would have a joy, that we wouldn't just be run into the ground and joyless, where we're just persevering, running it out, uh, trying to just push our way forward through it. Uh, let's pray that we have a spirit of endurance, but it, that, it, that it would be a joyful endurance. And so let's pray for the necessary refreshment that all of us need and pray for us that we would receive that spiritual refreshment as well. I would take to heart these eight points as we ask at times for you to pray for your spiritual leaders. Um, no better example than Paul here saying pray for, for him and his team in the way that he stated. So let's take note of these. Let's pray more specifically, more fervently. Let's, let's intercede with our supplications for the spiritual leaders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for these words from Paul. Thank you for his humility that as an apostle, you would think he would need any prayer, but my, he, he needed it more than anyone. And Lord, spiritual leaders need prayer. We think of Spurgeon who had such great ministry success and it was because his people prayed for him. May, may we have great spiritual success here because our people pray for us. Lord, uh, do a great work. May our, may our church family through this prayer summit get a greater burden for praying for their pastors and leaders and missionaries. May this burden carry on beyond the 10-day prayer summit. May we be men and women who are diligent, standing in the gap, interceding, praying for others. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for this good day. We look forward to the services this entire week. And uh, may people have a, a, a joyful desire to join in, in each of these as they're able. So, Lord, thank you for this good Lord's Day. Bless us this week. Use us as we serve you. Do indeed give us opportunities to get the gospel out and give us boldness when they come. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, folks, great to have you out this evening. Uh, you can join us at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, there's a CIM meeting at 11. Uh, Colin Richards is going to step in this week and start speaking on prayer and the, the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer. So that will be at noon. So if you're in a position to hear, step in on that, join that meeting, please do. And then tomorrow night, Pastor Skip Hunter will be speaking at 7 on the topic of prayer. Next Saturday, as I mentioned in my newsletter and this morning, uh, we will pray about our reopening. We'll share more details with you how that looks. If you might have questions and answers. Uh, please forward them to our pastors or our deacons this week and, and or uh, next Saturday night. Let's take some of those questions and try to uh, come together on the right sheet together to, to reopen the church. Well, Lord bless you. Have a great Memorial Day tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to seeing you as early as possible, as early as seven. Lord bless you. Bye-bye.